coming up next on Business Minds Coffee Chat. I had to really get mentored correctly in this. I was mentored by Dr. Helen Mendez, who taught at USC, University of Southern California. And she took a liking to me and she worked with me for 18 years. And she really did help me to realize that it is not my place to fix anybody. I cannot fix anybody, but I can help them with the right tools, the right skills, help them to work on their attitude and then know that I did the best I could. And then I have to live my life at the same time. And I I tell you, and if you do not create those boundaries, then you're in trouble because you're carrying too many caseloads with you. The fact that you're listening to this podcast tells me that you're someone who values their time and is interested in improvement and growth. I've learned over the years that those who want to get better, who want to sharpen their skills, hire coaches. I started my coaching business because I saw firsthand how having the right coach transformed a family member's business and life. This had a profound impact on me, and it's my mission to help others have a similar positive experience. If you've ever thought about hiring a business coach, check this out. Working with me as your coach, you'll gain more clarity on your goals and priorities, be held accountable, learn and apply the tools to maximize your potential, build a rock-solid foundation for your business, and achieve the results and success you deserve. Warren Buffett said, The best investment you can make is in yourself. If you're ready to commit to your personal and professional development, let nothing hold you back. To apply to my coaching program and to schedule a call with me to learn more, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com and click the Book Now button at the top. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, enjoy the latest episode. Hello, my name is Tim Story, and you are watching right now Business Minds Coffee Chat with Jay Shear. What a privilege to be on this amazing program. This is Business Minds Coffee Chat, where those interested in personal and professional growth come to listen to and learn from extraordinary business leaders, thought leaders, best-selling authors, renowned psychologists, neuroscientists, and others who are changing the world through the work they do. I'm your host, Jay Shear. Welcome to the conversation. There's a simple yet wise mantra that I often think about that says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. We all experience life interruptions, illnesses, relationship issues, business challenges. The question is, how do we move past these setbacks, change our mentality, and turn them into comebacks? Well, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about these topics and many more. Our guest is an acclaimed author, speaker, life coach, and pastor known for helping others turn setbacks into comebacks. He's inspiring and motivating people from all walks of life and has traveled to over 75 countries and spoken to millions of people. He's been featured on countless shows and media outlets, including Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday, Fox News, The Huffington Post, and many others. Please welcome the world shaker himself and the man Quincy Jones calls the voice of inspiration to this generation, Tim Story. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. It is wonderful to see you. What a privilege. So I'm a fan of what you're doing and knowing that I was going to be on the program, I studied you even more. (laughs) And so um, I'm excited about today's conversation. As am I. And getting to know you and researching you and consuming your content, honestly, Tim, has been, not only has it been inspirational, but it's been transformative in a number of ways. And, you know, it's funny, before we started recording, we were talking a bit about some of the things that you do in the morning and walking. And your latest book, I actually purchase that as an audible book. And so I listen to that each morning. I listen to that during part of my morning routine. And it has been 
just so incredibly helpful. So we're going to be digging into that here as well. So before we do, I thought that a good starting point for us to really dive into the conversation would be, I'd, I'd love it if you could share with us the moment where you realized that you had the the gift and the ability to be able to transform lives. Yeah, Jay, I, I think that, you know, like for many people, um, you know, all of us have what I call a calling. We have a calling. And I think that our calling calls us. Um, I'll start with a, a, a brief story that, as you know, I, I work with entertainers. So mm-hmm. many times to find out about the entertainer, you could ask the mother a lot about the child. <laughs> so I was having lunch with Brad Pitt's mother, uh, who's really nice, Jane Pitt. And I was talking about what did Brad want to do when he was younger? It's amazing that what he wanted to do, he's doing. He wanted to be, of all things, an architect. Hmm. He wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a humanitarian, and he, he has done it. So, as you know, I work with Robert Downey, and I was talking to Robert's mother on the set of a movie, and everything that he wanted to do is what he's doing. Humanitarian, director, producer, actor, all those things. So I could go and tell you maybe 10 celebrities, same thing, including P. Diddy uh, and his mother just the other day. So I feel like for me, my calling was calling me at an early age. And that calling was to help the struggler, to help the underdog, to help the person who needed a boost. Now, I didn't know everything about it, I just knew that I had something in my heart that really cared about hurting people. And that started early. I'm talking eight, nine, 10 years of age. When I'd see kids at school that would be bullied or a young kid at school named Freddie who had asthma, I had a heart towards him. But it was over time with the right tutors and mentors that I began to discover uh, what I was really called to do. And many people help pull that gift out of me. Interesting. So was there a particular catalyst or something that led to that calling where your eyes were opened and you were at a point where you could receive it and actually work with that gift? Yeah, 100%. I think that uh, like in, in our family, we had uh, five children and my mother and father, but we were lower income in, in Compton, California. We were very crowded. Uh, I won't even tell you the number of rooms. It was very small. Just know my, my brother and I had to sleep in the living room. <laughs> so um, I think that to feel the cramp, the, the crowded, the confinement felt so limiting. And when I begin to experience other kids in school and sometimes visit their houses and see that they did not live that way. And their refrigerator was full and their house had more joy and peace. I said, wow, my house is really missing a tempo. There was not a tempo of you can, you will, you might go to Harvard or Yale. It was more of a survival type of environment that I was initially raised in. So with that said, what words, as you think about your past and how far you've come and what you've learned, the valuable lessons that you've had throughout the years, what what words come to mind that you would use to describe yourself? I would say, um, I would say compassionate. I would say uh, full of mercy, not a low dose, (laughs) a high dose. But I would also say a very good listener. And, you know, as I got older and I began to work with Walter Matthau, Jack Lemon. Charlton Heston, Tony Curtis, 
as I moved into Beverly Hills and became a very well-known life coach, what a lot of these older gentlemen would say to me is, you know, Tim, one reason we love to dialogue with you is you're a phenomenal listener. And, and that is something that's almost a missing skill set. So I think my ability to listen and really hear what someone's saying and not always looking for the answer before they've spoken, maybe their pain. I think that that's part of my superpower is listening. Yeah, it, it's really, it's remarkable when you listen to you speak and when you're engaging with someone, when I watch some of the work that you do and your, uh, your church services as an example, it, it almost seems like you are so fully present in the moment and that you're, you're connecting with people on a level that you don't often see. And that to me is, it's a skill set. And is it, is that a, a, a skill that you have honed over time? Is that something that you've been very intentional about working on? Would you say that came naturally to you? It's a great question, Jay. Great question. I think, I think it's innate, number one, but more than natural, it's definitely a skill set I've honed and worked hard on it. Because I think that you've heard it said before, if we're not careful, we'll become human doings instead of a human being. Uh, but I would say almost all my best friends say, Tim is almost always fully present, fully feeling and fully alive. Like I, I'm literally right here right now. And I think part of that is, as Stephen Covey says, somebody's urgent is not necessarily mine. So there's, there's constantly people looking for me at all times in the, of the day and night because of what I do for a living. Wow. But the, their urgent is not always mine. I have to stay in that moment. Otherwise, I might miss something that could help change somebody's life and change my life. Amazing. So I, I would love to explore for a couple of minutes the why behind the work that you do. I mean, you've you've listed off already a number of of amazing people that you've had the opportunity to work with and to help along their journey, which yes. is an awesome responsibility as a coach as a mentor, as someone who, whether it's spiritually related or not, someone who has that responsibility to guide someone and help them through a transformative process. So why? What, why do you do this type of work? What is it that, that drives you, that motivates you, that gets you out of bed every day and being able to show up your best self? I think part of it, uh, Jay, is the people that I studied in my formative years, starting my junior year of high school, I read a book about the life of Mother Teresa, who was a nun, and she was a school teacher, but she heard the cries of the orphans, and she decided to give up her job as a teacher to shift to deal with the cries of the orphans. And Little did she know she'd be one of the most well-known names in the world today and still be helping tens of thousands of people on a daily basis, even after she has passed. So I studied Mother Teresa. I studied Nelson Mandela. I, started, I studied Gandhi. I studied Jesus uh, through the Gospels. And what I learned is that there's, very, there's a lot of value in being a servant. And really being a person that serves another person's dream, uh, serves another person's life. And, and that is the lifestyle that I chose. When I went to seminary as a teenager, later went on to get my doctorate in world religion, I never thought about being a pastor 
that seemed very religious to me or <laughs> being like a, a guy on Christian TV that seemed kind of hokey, to be honest. But what I did want to do is what I was called to do, and that was serve people. So whether it be from the inner cities that I still do, third world nations, the orphanages, working with Robert Downey Jr. Uh, in prison reform, working with the elderly, elderly abuse, all that is part of my calling and that is to serve people. So that is where I really get um, a lot of fulfillment is in serving people. I really truly do get fulfillment from this. So when you are serving others, when you are working with those that are having difficult times in their lives, no matter what it is, it could be abuse situations, it just could be challenges dealing with everyday things that happen in life. How do you, as a coach, how are you able to help them but then not allow what they're going through to become part of who you are. So are, are you able to separate that? And if so, how do you do that? It's extremely difficult. So that's why you see, let, let's take other professions where dentists have a, a lot of um, anxiety and depression that is talked about within that profession. Doctors, same, mostly surgeons dealing with delicate situations. Uh, clergy burnout from uh, priests, rabbis, ministers, monks, a lot of burnout going on. And so I had to really get mentored correctly in this. I was mentored by Dr. Helen Mendez, who taught at USC, University of Southern California. And she took a liking to me and she worked with me for 18 years. And she really did help me to realize that it is not my place to fix anybody. I cannot fix anybody, but I can help them with the right tools, the right skills, help them to work on their attitude and then know that I did the best I could and then I have to live my life at the same time. Mm. And I, I tell you, and if you do not create those boundaries, then you're in trouble because you're carrying too many caseloads with you. So I, I've become very good at something very tragic could happen. Like I just uh, officiated a funeral just three days ago. And in the moment I was there, I stayed with the family. I talked with the family. But two hours later, I had to go into Tim's story, a guy who's creating a TV show. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing of, of boundaries. Yeah. So I want to better understand that, if, if we can maybe unpack that a little bit and talk about process and, and maybe some of the things that you do from a mindset standpoint. And, and the reason I want to explore that a bit, Tim, is our audience is made up of different business leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, et cetera. And, you know, everyone experiences those, those challenges in their lives and being able to come home at the end of a day of dealing with a number of issues in their businesses and being able to be present for not only themselves, but for their families, for their friends yes, and not carry all that with them where it's going to affect the rest of their lives. How can they process that? What, what are some things that they can think about, tell themselves, talk, talk, a bit about your process because yeah. you experience that all the time, all the conversations you have. Yes. And, and so I'm going to give uh, respect to a man named Dennis Waitley, who was one of the first ones who did the wheel of success. And in that wheel, he talked about the physical body, the mental, the clarity of mind, the spiritual life, the job, the finances, the family, 
But then he goes on to mention something interesting, the social life, okay? And I feel that for people that all of us that are uh, going through life as we are, and those of you that are listening, that we can have balance. And I hear a lot of my friends saying they do not believe in balance, but I will tell you, they look like they don't have balance. <laughs> I, I believe in balance. I, I believe in uh, vacations. I believe in sleeping. I believe in exercise. I believe in joyful moments. I believe in making time for magical moments. I believe in putting God uh, first and my family second and my job third. Uh, I believe that when you follow those types of guidelines that you can have a fulfilled life. And because this is that in life, you're always going through either recovery or discovery at all times. So let's say in your family life, you're going through a recovery zone. Maybe your, your daughter's challenged or your son is challenged, right? So, so that's one area. And if, and if you just focus just on that, you're missing the other areas where you might be getting blessed. And that's in your own marriage, in your physical body, in your job, in your finances. So I, I like to break it into that wheel and work on that wheel on a daily basis. I do it on a daily basis. I look at that wheel and I, and I take inventory of where I am that week. Mm, I love that. I think that's a great not only exercise, but practice for all of us to put into place. It's a great reminder and gives us much greater perspective as well. So I, I would love it if you would share with us part of your morning routine, some of the things that you do to start your day the right way so you're showing up empowered and ready to serve at the highest level that you do serve at. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a person that even if I'm taking a long road trip, I don't, I don't like the, the gas tank to get too empty. I just don't like the feeling. And so I will make people laugh. They'll say, Tim, we have a half a tank of gas. We're doing well. You know, maybe we're driving L.A. to San Francisco. I go, it's OK. Let's go to Starbucks and get more gas. It, it's the same thing in life. I, I cannot afford to let my, my gas tank, my spiritual tank in this case, get really low. Then I'm in trouble. So I, I really do the thing where I wake up brush my teeth, wash my face. I have my clothes set out already. And I walk for an hour or an hour and a half. And I listen to either a podcast, like one like yours, or I listen to a book on tape, or I listen to the Bible on tape. And what am I doing? I'm renewing my mind. Because my, my background is Christian. And there's a scripture, Romans 12, that says that renew your mind and then you will know God's will. And as I renew my mind and cleanse my mind, it's amazing that things unfold rather than me trying to just push them out and manifest them on my own. So I, I walk or, or for an hour, hour and a half, then I have a gym in my uh, house, in my garage that a friend of mine purchased all the equipment, over $25,000 worth of equipment. I have a gym, I work out four or five days a week. I do that, but I'm gonna tell you something, Jay, at that time, and just this is us talking as friends, I probably have 40 texts or calls that have come in by that time already. Wow. Okay, so if I, just jumped on somebody's urgent. And, and what the texts say many times is, come on, Tim, can't you give me five minutes? <laughs> because I, I life coach people that play at a very high level and they're used to getting what they want. <laughs> they're like, I need a quick answer from Tim's story. And that's a compliment that they are asking for me. But I, I can't give them what they want if I'm dealing with a tank that's almost on empty. So I have to fill my 
tank every day, I go from my overflow. So since I'm from Compton, I'm going to rant, rhyme. I flow from my overflow. Love that. So, so powerful. Are, are there any non-negotiables that you have? So I, just to give a bit of context, you mentioned that during part of your morning routine, you'll receive all of these text messages, emails, and the like. So do you have a, sp- a specific uh, process where you say, I'm not responding or even checking those text messages or emails until... So is, are there non-negotiables for you when it comes to health and spirituality and life care? It, it is an until. And the people that really need me, they have access to uh, three of my assistants that they know if it's really urgent, then the assistant knows another way to get a hold of me. And so, because that does happen sometimes, because... I deal with people who are struggling through addiction, recovery, Mm -hmm. mental illness. Maybe we've had a breakdown. Maybe somebody got in trouble late that night and they need me urgently. So on those matters that my staff knows how to find me. And, but otherwise, um, Jay, if I do not protect, if I do not protect my mindset and if I do not protect my soul, my spirit, Because the Bible says out of the heart comes the issues of life. So therefore, guard your heart. So my joy comes from my heart. My peace comes from my heart. My contentment comes from my heart. My courage comes from my heart. And my better decision-making comes from my heart. So I have to protect that. Absolutely. So speaking of protecting your peace... When you're confronted with a a challenge with a client that you're working with, is there any type of issue problem that you won't address? I will address them all, but I feel at times, Jay, that what they're dealing with, whether it be a, a male or female, might not be what my strength is. So I, I, I do deal with psychiatrists. I do deal with psychologists. I do deal with other health coaches, um, uh, physical fitness coaches, healthy nutrition coaches. And so a, a lot of my more famous clients, um, I'm known for like putting a team together. And for some of these people, there's three to five people on the team because it's that big of a star. And in order to keep them on the the right path, uh, I never think that I am the answer. I'm really good at certain things and only so good at other things. So I've always just felt, Jay, I'm, I'm a piece of the puzzle, but I must be good at what I do because the people are coming. I'm, I'm, I'm really good at turning your setback to come back. I, that, that I got down pretty well. Absolutely. And you've written a book all about it, so, yes. which by the way, we are going to link in the show notes, Tim's books, because we certainly want to be able to emphasize yes. and amplify those because there's some great content and it's not just reading and consuming. It's actually taking the information and putting it into practice. And with that said, I want to jump right into your latest book. And I, I mentioned to you that I've been listening to that book. I've, I've already gone through it one and a half times, but I listen to it when I'm exercising, when I'm walking, when I'm on the, the elliptical. And that's my time to really delve into what's most meaningful to me and set Mm -hmm. me up for success for that day. And so let's, what I would love for you to share first about your, your latest book is what was the process like bringing that book to life? Yes. Jay, as you know, with projects that you do, um, it was conceived years ago and I would observe as I would travel the world and meet a lot of people 
And the more I got to know them, I, I, I found people caught in what I call a mundane life, mundane, normal, regular, status quo. And a lot of people, almost by accident, you will ask them, how are they doing? How, how are you doing? I'm okay. How are your kids? Okay. How, how's your job? Okay. And, and so they were late living in the land of okay. Then I would find the more I got to know somebody that not only were they maybe caught up in mundane, but they were also caught up in messy. So I met a lot of very together people who do well financially, but they were always putting out fires. There was always this mess, this mess, this mess, this mess. And then I saw the third tier, which was a lot of people got caught up in this madness, which was chaos. So I began to start writing notes years ago about where's the magic? Where's the extraordinary? Where's the unusual? Because little kids love the magic. And so I have researchers. And so I started talking to psychologists and other thought leaders and doing my own research and having other researchers study and literally compiled probably 75 pages on the subject of play, P-L-A-Y on why kids like to play. It allows their imagination to just soar. It is the habitat that they love to be in because they're playful, they're full of imagination. They many times have um, a friend that we can't see, but they can see that friend. <laughs> and they wanna be astronauts and presidents and NBA stars and doctors and all these things. And I thought, what happened? What happened to the five-year-old with the look in his eye, right? And the glow in his face that said, yes, you can. <laughs> so I, I wrote a book to take a step-by-step -step on how to align ourselves with who we really are. I believe that we could return to that innocence and we could think magical thoughts just as we have in the past. Fantastic. And and you start off the book with telling the story of Disneyland and yes. that that magic and that aha moment that that you experienced. And the 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 book is um it, it's such a great read, and it really is a step-by-step -step process. And as you consume the words in this book. You, and, and I'm talking about this from an experiential yes. standpoint, mm -hmm. you will feel the mindset shift that occurs. And if you put into practice, and, and I'm speaking to everyone right now who's watching and listening this, when you are actually reading and putting into practice what Tim has written here, you will see changes in your life. But like most things, you have to take action. Yes. Right. You action is that's where the magic occurs. So I it has been a, a blessing to be able to read the, the 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 book itself and to be able to consume your words. And I'm so appreciative that you took the time to create that book and allow the rest of us to benefit from, from your words. So thank you for that. And Jay, thank you for that too. And for the compliment on the book. Um, I, I think, you know, I think many times people, they think that one does a project because I think I just want to do a project. Uh, but I, 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 I like to really, um, you share from my heart about things like for instance as a as a speaker when you do it um as long as i have and you become known for being pretty good you get paid a lot of money so when you go do these big conferences and you know all over the world they pay you very very well you know this whole idea of book writing is a lot of work <laughs> it is a lot of work because i did it with harper Collins, number one book publishing company in the world. So they have a lot of guidelines, a lot of things they want, demands on time. 
Then I got an amazing editor uh, named Nick Childs who teaches at Princeton University. And he's a thinker. And I, I'm telling you, Jay, that was challenging for me because I like to rhyme a lot. <laughs> so I, I, I like to say things like, don't sit in your setback, don't settle, don't submit. And he, and he would look at me like this on Zoom and go, that's all you got on that? <laughs> Can we go, go deeper. a little deeper? Go deeper. Can we, can we go a little deeper? And I'm telling you, I felt like Muhammad Ali against Joe Frazier in the early days. Like the first three months for us was us boxing with each other. And, and I remember one day he said, you're starting to get it. Mm. You're writing like a writer, not like just a talker. And man, like something just released. And I started to really write like a writer. And so he says, okay, so all that other stuff that we've written, we're tossing that. And, oh and I'm like, gosh. what? I'm like, oh, oh, look, look, oh, my baby. And so I'm very, very excited about this book. It's well thought out. Um, people like yourself who are intelligent are loving the book. And I, and I, I talk about miracle mentality and parenting, as you know, and your job and your finances and your own personal life and your own mindset. I think it's an essential book and that's why it's doing so well. You know, by the grace of God and friends like you, the book is doing extremely well. I think it's gonna have a long run, but it's doing extremely well. We should hit New York Times bestseller list probably in three weeks. Outstanding. And Oprah's interviewing me again. And, you know, just so many doors that have opened uh, over the years where all my friends have been nice from Fox News to CNN, to MSNBC, to Netflix, et cetera. So I think that the, the message is needed mostly at a time like this. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it, it's amazing how, how things like that happen. And I don't believe that there's any coincidences there. So for the book to have come out when it did at the right time with the right message. And it's, it's a global message, which is great. So it's not, you know, you've covered so many different buckets. You know, you talked about Dennis Waitley and that yeah. circle, right? So you've, you've yes. hit on each of those buckets, which creates, it, it's for everyone, right? It, it's, for, mm. it's for everyone to be able to benefit from and to learn from and to gain greater perspective. So again, we're going to put the link in the show notes here, and I would highly encourage everyone to go and pick up a copy of The Miracle Mentality, and whether it's in hard copy form or electronic, just get a copy of the book. And you will absolutely thank me for it. That's not what I'm asking for here, but I know that our audience is going to benefit from, from this one. It's out, outstanding. Thank you so, for that, Jay. I mean, absolutely. My pleasure. So, you know, with, with all of the different types of challenges that you've helped people overcome, if you were to, to, to try to come up with a, an average reason that, people hold themselves back from overcoming setbacks. What, what would you say it is? What would you point to? I, I would say that one of the biggest ones is disappointment, is this idea of, let's say someone's trying to break addiction. And let's say it's to alcohol. And they've tried and they tried and they tried and they went to programs, maybe even went to rehab. And then they find themselves re relapsing. What, what I find, it's so easy to then live in the land of okay. Of You know, Tim, I've, I've just seen that maybe I am a functioning alcoholic. It's because they've become so disappointed. Or a woman that says to me, I loved this man for 40 years. We were married. You know, why would he choose this time to just up and leave and say the marriage is not working? Okay. So in trying to get that kind of a client to see that that is painful, that is a setback, but we can find a way through it. We can take inventory, we can partner with the right people, we can get a new plan, we could have the right principles, we can become more persistent, you know, that's part of my process. 
I would say disappointment is one of the major things that keep people stuck in that setback. Mm. And they get disappointed and disappointed and disappointed and they decide to just rest. Nope, it's too much. I'm not going back to the gym. I'm not going back to temple. I'm not even gonna call my mother anymore. She's, she doesn't get me. Interesting, right? Disappointment. That, that really is. That Actually, that answer surprises me a bit. That's not what I would have thought. And I, I quite frankly, I, I would have thought it was the fear of change, the fear of the work that's required to overcome whatever that happens to be. So thank you for, for sharing that wisdom. But can I tell you something, Jay? Because, because I think they, they almost go hand in hand. Mm. So because they many times people will fear change because they say, what if I put all that energy into changing and then it doesn't work again? So really that disappointment and that fear with a lot of my clients does go hand in hand. Ah, interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So Tim, before I ask my final question to you, where can we go to engage with you to consume your content? And obviously we're going to link to your books. Where else can we go to reach out to you? Uh, I think the best place is uh, timstory.com and uh, story is S-T-O-R-E-Y as you guys will put in the link. So Outstanding. Well, we'll definitely link to that as well. And Tim, you are, I love it. You're, you're everywhere. You continue to look for ways to deliver more value, to serve more and just keep bringing your best self to, to the table. I think it's outstanding. So here is my final question to you. What is the most valuable, unexpected lesson that you've learned from a client and how did it impact you? I would say, I'm going to go to Quincy Jones. Um, Quincy Jones said to me one time, he says, you're too, you too, you're too careful in everything you say. <laughs> he said, you, you process everything you say because you probably have had to. It's true, because when you're a speaker, it's almost like a slide presentation. You need to let it go around once before you say it. You may say something that's not great. And I'll never forget one night at Quincy Jones' house, which I've been around him for over 25 years. He said, tonight, this is a zone where nothing is wrong. No idea is wrong. Because we're working on a project. He said, don't you dare get intimidated by me. Don't get nervous about what I might think about you. This is like a no fault zone, no judgment zone. So I'm gonna throw out a topic. You tell me what you really think. Oh my goodness, you talk about liberating. It was amazing. That was one of the best lessons I've ever learned that sometimes Jay, we need to go into that place of we're not gonna be judged and just really talk to a friend and say, this is an idea. Hmm. It, you know, it, maybe it may not be perfect. It's not completely well thought out, but, but this is the idea because you might come up with something brilliant. And I will say this, that he said he did this to Michael Jackson and that's how they came up with the song, Billie Jean. Cause they yeah. had completely different lyrics and, and they threw it into that space and they created the beat they created the lyrics and that song has gone all over the world. And it's still one of the highest selling albums of all time. Thriller. Amazing. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I again, I just want to thank you so much. I'm grateful for you. Thank you for sharing of your knowledge and your wisdom and your spirit, Tim, and your my gosh, I mean, talk about showing up, talk about being present, talking about connecting. You've done all of that 
and so much more. And I know that our audience is going to receive tremendous value from everything that you share today. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. You're you're welcome. And what a privilege to serve on your program today. So for all my people that follow me, make sure and follow everything that Jay is doing and all his information will be right there. Thank you for tuning into Business Minds Coffee Chat. Your support helps us continue to bring you amazing guests. Please share the show with a friend and subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Here's to your personal and professional growth. Thank you.